honored that I'm here to get to introduce you to both Sam and Peter who are here today. And um, I, I know you haven't seen the film yet, so this will be sort of like a pre-lesson on, on what you will see when you see Chicken Run coming out in December. But um, they did have their world premiere in London just last week at the London Film Festival. They're making their way around, kind of showing and telling here and there. You guys have a special opportunity though today to, to see some of the behind the scenes work that uh, Sam will take you through in a minute. So um, with that, I think I'm going to ask uh, both Sam and Peter to come out. So guys, from the back, drum roll please, our, our esteemed guest. <laughs> Director Sam Fell, <laughs> and co-founder and executive producer, Peter Lord. So I'm just gonna give you super quick background on their, I mean, you guys probably know this, I'm, I'm speaking to folks that know, but uh, Sam joined Armin as a director and animator on commercials and short film long ago worked on uh, Peter's Watts Pig and also Chump and um, Rex the Run and other, other projects. Um, he also developed a, a children's TV series, Rabbits, and several feature projects, which you know, one of them, Flushed Away, I'm sure you know really well. Um, he was uh, recently the director on The Tale of Despero for Universal. Uh, well, not that recent. Then, then he went to Portland for, uh, recent in, in, yes, in the evolution of time, no. Uh, to, to historic films that you may know and projects you may know. He also uh, was in Portland with Laika, working on Paranorman with Chris Butler. Um, both of our gentlemen here today are, are esteemed, nominated, award-winning producer, director folks. I mean, I'm not even going to spend all my time listing how many. I think, Peter, your, your record has something like, what did I write down? Where did I see that? 18 wins and 26 nominations over the course of your career. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, but yeah, so Sa Sam is going to present to you some behind the scenes work, but I also want to, while I'm standing up here, introduce Peter to you, who you already know, I'm sure. But uh, co-founder and creative director of Armin, dating back to, well, working in collaboration since 1972, right, with David Sprockton? Yes. So let me just, let me just say, that's over 50 years, so <laughs> incredible, right? I know. 50 years of creative collaboration is incredible, so. Thank you for sharing that with the world through now Ardman for so many years. Um, we're, we're thrilled to have you here. And I'm again, you know his esteemed bio from forever. I, I will say I was thrilled that I didn't even know who you were when I first saw your work through uh, Peter Gabriel's Sledgehammer video. That's how old I am, you guys. Some of you weren't even born yet, okay? We're talking last century here. <laughs> But um, but I think I fell in love with Armin really when I watched Creature Comforts. That was really where I was like, oh my goodness, such beautiful art and, and, and heartfelt characters. So anyway, enough for me. We're going to let Sam show you uh, some behind the scenes work first. Then we'll do some Q&A amongst us just to kind of, you know, get everybody's brains going that way. And then we'll ask for questions from the audience. So uh, enjoy the show. and. I'll talk more later. Now I'm going to pass it to Sam. Cool. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm going to sit. I usually jump around a bit, but I'm going to sit here uh, like a newsreader. Uh, welcome to the news. Um, so I'm going to start, uh, let's just start at the beginning for this project anyway. Um, there it is. Chicken Run. Okay, so th take your minds back to the year 2000 when your phone wasn't a camera. Uh, Pierce, Pierce Brosnan was James Bond. Uh, and if you wanted to know how to spell anything, you had to get this weird big book called a dictionary and look it up. <laughs> uh, so yeah, dark times, my friends, but it was a, the ray of light was Chicken Run came out um, based on the greatest elevator pitch of all time, The Great Escape with Chickens. <laughs> Which, uh, yeah, fabulous idea. Uh, Pete, and, uh, Pete and Nick went over to Hollywood, sold this, sold this idea to, to DreamWorks. Spielberg loved it, Katzenberg loved it, and off they went. And it was a real milestone. He can speak to this more than me. You know, it was a 25 year milestone for the studio. It was a, a massive deal to gear up from half hours to be a real proper big feature studio and had to, you know, like, um, you know, train people and, you know, grow the whole place to do this uh, astonishing thing. It was massively popular, um, a, a masterpiece, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> And so, yeah, kind of, kind of difficult and daunting to come up with the next one, you know, to follow something like that. It's, that's a big, the bar's so high. Um, but as usual, as with the first movie, it was one single line that unlocked this movie. 
So I think it's around about 2015, it's before my time. Pete was already working with Kerry Kirkpatrick, the, the original writer, and they came up with the line, this time, they're breaking in. <laughs> so simple, simple idea, simple line, but it just opens up a whole new type of movie for Arvman, the break-in movie, a heist. Um, and a lot of like the sort of, you know, the promise of that premise is just very comic. And Pete had done these really great drawings of the characters uh, in action hero mode. Um, and it just instantly, you can see, you know, the, the funny thing is scale for a star and like the, the silly little props that they would use to kind of overcome this giant um, um, new challenge. Uh, there's the sort of comedy in making a chicken like Bunty into an action hero of the sort of level of, of Rambo. Um, and so all kinds of like, you know, the, the tropes uh, to play with, you know, and so, uh, you know, it, it's kind of that, that to me, it just drew me in, you know, they're just it, literally these drawings uh, just, just grabbed me and I was in. Um, so we got started simply by just brainstorming with storyboard artists, thinking about how do chickens get around inside this building, you know, like without being seen and, you know, what, what you know, how does that all work? What's the comic possibility? And of course, it's not just, a, when you see the movie, you'll see that it's not just a pastiche of a heist movie. It's not as simple as that as there's other levels. It's about bringing up a family in a very dangerous world. It's about um, the plight of strangers. Uh, it's about food fighting back. Uh, so it's about all kinds of things, but definitely always it's got to be fun to watch. And like all the album movies, we, we, you know, it's, it's a big entertaining um, uh, invitation to an audience to come and have fun. So yeah, it's a bigger, badder challenge though. And like the, the, uh, the other thing that these guys had in place already was that we would be moving into a new era, a new era farming, industrial scale farming and food production, because it had to be a bigger, badder challenge than last time. Uh, and so we're into the early 60s. It's like a, it's like a, you know, this exaggerating this factory um, and, and imagining, yeah, you can imagine the high security that would be all around the world's first nugget, right? You know, that secret recipe. Um, and so we were just having fun, always just exaggerating for scale. And it did become just naturally a very big movie, you know, like we, we pushed the scale of it to the level of a Bond movie, really. You know, this place turned into a Bond villain's lair, basically. <laughs> um, and, you know, with this awful, no, awful apocalyptic event for chickens at the center of it, the dawn of the nugget. And who better to be the super villain at the harvest than Mrs. Tweedy? Uh, I mean, I think she's, I mean, she's Harbin's Cruella de Vil, I think one of the great all-time, uh, you know, villains uh, of animation. Uh, what fun we had uh, restyling her in, in the sort of guise of a, of a Bond villain. We, you know, we went, did our research. And there was a Mary Quant exhibition on at the v and at that time in London, and that, that, those boots are the Mary Quant boots. We got the Valentino jacket. We, we had a lot of, and also, the other great uh, thing, delicious thing, was the rematch. Uh, the chance for Ginger to kind of like face off with her nemesis again. And it's sort of like a, you know, like all, he all heroes have to face their deepest, darkest fears. And we felt that Mrs. Tweedy would still be haunting Ginger, even though she's escaped and got everything she wants. So off we went um, and we started making. And honestly, making uh, a movie like this at Arvin is just a delight. So every day is, is just so wonderful because you're in it. Uh, people don't work from home, you know, well they might work from home on a little task in their shed, but they, ultimately everybody's there, you're in amongst it, you can see the movie, you can touch it, you can smell it, there's a very particular odour to plasticine and resin that's probably not very good for you, but to me it, it brings back so many happy memories. Um, so yeah, you're, you're completely surrounded by the film at all times, and so things are built and made in the different departments, and they're brought together onto the studio floor. And that's where it's, it's really wondrous because the look of the movie comes together right there and then between all the departments. So all the disciplines are working at the same time. You've got lighting, animation, rigging, um, set dressing. And that, that whole thing comes together in concert with everybody working together. And what I love is that everyone can see each other's problems. You know, like the lighting people can see the problems that the animator's got reaching the puppet. The rigger needs to get their piece in here. So someone, the art department's got to make some room there. And it, it, I mean, every animated movie is a massive team game, of course, but there's something in 
this. It's so um, warm and human and, and very tangible. Uh, and there's a great sort of empathy to it, you know, I, I think, you know, in, in working the, in amongst the team. Uh, and it's not on screens generally, you know, you're up on your feet, you're moving around, you can do, you know, you can cover eight miles a day uh, once one, when the shoot's fully sh shooting. So, you know, it's not too sedentary. Uh, and lighting, well, <laughs> Lighting stop motion animation is just an absolute joy, you know, it's, um, you, you make something beautiful, you light it well, you photograph it through a really nice lens, you've got a stunning look, it's over 100 years old, it's not new technology, uh, but it, just, it still works, it's, it's not only is it beautiful, but it just works, and um, so I think sometimes the newest tech is not always the best tech, always, you know, sometimes let's remember the old tech, the bicycle, for instance, there's another nice piece of old technology that's very useful still and works. Um, so yeah, bigger, badder challenge for the chickens, but also a bigger, badder challenge for the crew. And here's why, it's all down to scale, and we've got our puppets here today, you can see them afterwards. But that is basically the smallest we could make the Molly puppet. Uh, if we went any smaller, then the animator couldn't really animate it. You know, you'll see that face is about the size of your thumb. And you look at the detail of the animation that goes into that face. We couldn't go any smaller with that, nor could we go any bigger with Mrs. Tweedy, because as, as you go bigger with your puppet, then her sets get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the studio ceiling is only so high. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you know, so we realised at that point that although we'd had a great deal of fun exaggerating the size and scale and scope of this thing, we actually built ourselves as ginormous problem we had to deal with, which is scale. And we would have to com be combining puppet scales constantly, because if you think of the first movie, they're confined in the huts for a lot of time, so they're down in their chicken scale. So a lot of stuff could be done in camera, uh, and the humans were kept separate. Even when they were in the same scene, the humans and the chickens, these guys very cleverly storyboarded to shoot in different directions, and avoid that kind of compositing headache. Uh, and. Um, so, but we didn't do that, of course, no, we'd, we'd, we'd cause ourselves a big, this, this time they're breaking in, I blame that line, you know, because they're out, they're out in the human world, they're in the land of the giants. So, what cracked it for us is I really wanted to work with Darren, our production designer, who used this gravity sketch thing, uh, and it looks a little bit weird from a distance, but when you get into it, it's pretty amazing, because he was able to sketch out in 3D all of the worlds and environments for us even before we started storyboarding and even as we were early starting storyboarding so it enabled us to scout locations together uh, and figure out a three-dimensional blueprint for the movie which we would need in order to break it into separate parts into separate scale items and elements and so the dp um the you know the art department everyone could gather around so we'd we'd do these snapshots we'd do we'd do a it's going to stop in a minute yeah you saw there that we could do very early we we could establish a keyframe a key moment in the story we could get it painted and turned into a color key and that became a moment in the film two years later and it stuck and through that process we were able to develop a color script. Uh, again, VFX, lighting, art department, story, everybody there gathered around, really doing that first pass of the movie, which is like a very solid kind of blueprint. Because um, in stop motion, you don't have a layout department, you know, it's like, it's, it's kind of unique like that. It really does come together organically. But, and that's just fine if you're on one scale. So yeah, off we went into, I'm going to show you and then one of the the wider environments that break in. So you can see here, we could, we could scout, we could see, oh yeah, okay, that bit there is going to be chicken scale, so we'll build that, that chicken scale, and then we'll build the wider thing, human scale, and then in the background we can add map painting, set extension, and you know, so we figured out our jigsaw. Usual story though, you know, it's built on the floor. It's built in the, sh in the shop, first of all, top left. And it comes together on the floor, all the different, you know, disciplines, set dressing, with somebody on the, on with uh, Shane rigging a mole, figuring out how to, how to get a mole to pop up through the floor. Well, the sets started arriving on the floor, and boy, it was pretty um, shocking actually, because we'd been in lockdown, uh, and so we'd done all of that pre-production and gravity scratch and all of that virtual 
reproduction at home in the, on our little screens. And we knew it was big, but we didn't really know how big it was until the set started arriving. Uh, and it was, um, it was a bit shocking, really. You know, and you can see the ceiling there. You, know, you can see, well, we couldn't go up any higher. Um, so to put this scene together, uh, I, I would say we used, we used many, many tricks. We used many, many tricks. Stop motions went digital with The Corpse Bride around about 2001. Ever since then, green screens came in, rig removal, and it started to become like a semi-digital medium, even though it's very physical and we've kept the old, it's, it's still the old-fashioned way, um, but it is a digital medium. Um, I'm just going to, so let's, actually I don't want to play that, I'm going to play a little bit and play now, I'm going to go straight to this. So there's this wide shot, uh, there's this scene where the chickens start to break in. We're really looking forward to seeing the movie. But you can see these are the components that we use. So we have this big wide foreground set. Uh, you can see we could cut a hole there to get the animator in so they could reach that little puppet there, uh, all on green screen. So we had guard scale, which is a human scale, and he has his props. So there's a cake that comes up in this part of his defeat um, and his little sentry box. But we also built a bigger cake. Uh, so over here is a giant cake uh, uh, with a chicken in it, ginger. And we made some, a big pair of hands and arms in order so it looked like he was holding them. And it's just old school scale tricks. You know, it's like Fay Ray and King Kong's hand, you know, or Thief of Baghdad. It's like any, any it's really pretty old school stuff. Um, we shot Ginger, even though she was a different scale, we'd shoot her in the same play, part of the studio so she'd get the same lighting. There's no problem matching lighting. And then when we shoot, we shoot a beauty frame, of course, a daylight frame, but then we shoot other lighting passes that allow the compositors to create like the flickering of a firework. And, and we always love the real, and the whole thing about this is wherever we could, we use real reference and made real things or shot real stuff. So if we were going to do a firework, we just shot the firework in the studio. And, and it's, to be honest, it's more fun anyway than trying to like get, get someone to simulate a firework on a computer. So we would use these as actual plates and composite them as much as we could. So it's all about the real. Uh, so let me play you a breakdown. You know, this is how you can see it broken down now. So obviously, we've used digital to create the scale of the world back there. I really wanted to build a miniature model of that um, compound but we'd blown the art department's budget by that point, unfortunately. So, so yeah, we make as much as made as possible, um, and really the digital has allowed us to paint on a bigger canvas and make a kind of bigger scale feeling movie in this case. Um, which is all pretty much the one scale. <laughs> And the clay's animated on the cake and, the, and on the guy's face, so you get this kind of little clever the trick of the match. And then that's a giant firework, ginger scale firework, which is bigger than the one that's about to like drag him off into the woods. Obviously, that's a ginger scale, it's a different scale. You can see the lighting bar. Sorry guys, sorry. <laughs> it is actually a cut down. Yeah, so we've got, you know, we've got a lot of tricks going on, a lot of different methods have been used um, a lot of, from a lot of different ages, you know, and it's a real eclectic um, mix that, you know, that has evolved at the studio. But the most spectacular effect for me is always the performances of the characters. Uh, we begin with uh, puppets. Um, so the puppets not only have to look good, as they do down there at the end of the table, they've got to move good too. So inside there's these very intricate metal armatures that work with the precision of a Swiss watch. You know, like they will hold their position, any position, with a, within a fraction of a millimeter. They, they, can, you know, they can stand on one toe uh, and, and hold their pose. And then on the outside, the costumes have to be, you know, 
very look good but also have to move good in relationship to the movement of the armature and be very hard wearing um, because they're going to be touched you know thousands of times during the shoot. The arm and mouth system is a, is a real wonder I think and it's something that's evolved over years and years. It's all clay. The lower half are these replacement mouth shapes but they've, brought, they've got it down to a very elegant 14 shapes in order to, for, for a character to speak, which is, a, which is really wonderful. The great thing then is that because they're clay, the animators are able to in, do their in-betweening during the performance under camera. They're also able to improvise and improvise shapes, throw in some asymmetry, change from happy to sad. And the, the box of mouths actually grows from 14, you can get into the 20s and 30s. You know, as the, as the shoot goes on, you start, they start discovering these unique and wonderful new shapes that we like to keep. The upper half is all clay and can be animated constantly. So it's an improvisational um, uh, system, um, but it has the, the advantage of, of nailing down the design and having the continuity of design across many animators who are going to be animating the character. Um, are we now? Oh. So, oh dear, sorry, I think I'll. I might There we go again. Try this. So ultimately, let's see what. So yeah, ult but ultimately, it's a performance. They they animate straight through from frame one, all the way through to the end, um, and it's a it's a high wire act. You know, it's like we do all of this preparation and all of this um, uh, you know conversation, but in the end, it's down to you know in this case, Sean. It was his job to get her down the stairs and deliver her first line. Um, and it took him months to do that. Um, and it um, really is truly, as I say, a live performance. And so we do everything we can to prep the animators, but ultimately it's their scene. And we give the animators whole scenes each, um, the, the, uh, certainly the seniors. Um, and yeah, they, they magically somehow bring these scenes to life and make you care. And, um, Everything's captured at the same time, the lighting, the dressing, the design, the performance. Everything happens in this one-off unique moment. Uh, and you've got to kind of buy it, really. As a director, it's kind of quite nerve-wracking because they, t they go off and they do what they do. And when it comes back, you honestly have got to love it. Because <laughs> asking for take two after many weeks of work is um, quite a thing. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, I don't want that to happen. Um, could I pause this slide when I turn it on? Rocky! I actually want to play it. I want to describe it. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to describe it in the dark. Rocky! I'm going to describe it in the dark, and then you'll see what I'm talking about when you see it. But basically, we get four goes at a performance, generally, in general. First one is a storyboard. So in the storyboard, we get the storyboards artists put performance into the into the shot, and we discuss the performance a lot. And when we've recorded the voices, we do a final pass and really try and tighten up the performance. Then we act out with the animator. I will act out the the scene with the animator, and that allows us to have a conversation about the scene and what matters and what the shape of the scene is and whether high points and the low points and what's the what's the underlying emotion, etc. Uh, and so we create these videos uh, that we cut together in edit and sometimes re-time. Um, and they're like video reference, they're not to be copied. The best thing is that the animators start to get their head inside or their heart inside who the character is. Then they get one rehearsal, which is a really simple, blocky, chunky version of the shot where they just do the keyframing and try to um, figure out the camera speed and some basics. And it's also a lighting test at the same time. Um, and then again, <clears throat> also we'll retime that and edit, just in order to refine. It's the last chance for the director to talk to the animator about what could happen. And then the final version is the shot. They just go in and they just shoot this stuff, and they're amazing. And it's amazing to me that on this movie, 97% of this, the animation of this movie is take one. Um, wow. So it's a really stunning fact, I think. So I'm going to play it. You can see the scene. There's four boxes. You can see those four states on the go. Rocky! Little help? Maybe I could crawl on weekends, you know? Why am I not ready? I'm a big, brave girl. You always say so. I know. 
But you're still a child. Says who? Says me and your dad. Right, Rocky? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yes, listen to your mom, kiddo. Oh, oh, how about just half a crow? Like a... Or no, 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 you know, something that's a little shorter. I'm going over to see those trucks because I am a lone free ranger. Like Dad was. I've seen his poster. He used to live over there and you did too. <laughs> hmm. Did I say that? I don't... I don't remember. That's it. Molly, you are not leaving this island. You can't make me stay here. You're not the boss of me. Actually, I am. Look, Molly, you've got everything you want right here. Except for one thing. And what's that? Freedom. <laughs> okay, so that's the one you look at. That's it. Well, thank you. That was a wonderful behind the scenes. I really want to see you act out some of those scenes live for us now. <laughs> now that that's what you left us on, but well, but we if won't. The, if the apocalypse comes and all the machines break, then that's what we're going to be doing. I mean, you know. All right. Well, we'll take a few minutes just to talk amongst ourselves with questions. But if you guys have questions brewing in your head, keep that handy because we'll we'll jump to you in, in a few minutes. So. Um, I'm going to focus on like the story and the background of this because you gave us some wonderful technical, you know, your process, your production process and history. But I'm going to ask Peter, I'm going to start with you, Peter, to say some time has passed between Chicken Run films, like 1997 to 2023. So, had it, well, had, had you been thinking about Chicken Run the whole time is one question. And then how did it feel to finally, like, you know, crack that story to the point of we're ready to make a movie. Yeah. Tell us about that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to stand up because I can't see those people at the back. <laughs> no. Hello at the back there. Hello. Um, yeah, so we finished Chicken Run. It was released in 2000 and uh, Nick and I had directed it and we were completely broken men. We were exhausted by it. And, and then suddenly Jeffrey Katzenberg from DreamWorks said, okay, how about the sequel? And we hadn't given it a thought because we were just so focused on making the film. So, um, so uh, sequel, oh yeah, great idea, but dot, 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 we hadn't got an idea. We didn't have an idea. Also, God knows, we were working very hard to make the story of the first film complete. You know, so it reached an ending that the audience felt was satisfying and, and yeah, that, was our, that was our game. Our game was how to get these chickens out of out of prison and into the, into the real world, happily. So the idea of sort of starting again seemed kind of weird and counterintuitive. Which it, so we then thought about it a lot over the next uh, 15 years, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, yes, we did. We thought, God, we thought. So much thinking went on. Um, <laughs> and um, and we, we actually met, seriously, we met four or five times to see if we had an idea. We never did, and we, it just, we just didn't have momentum somehow. And then uh, I think we must have just, we must have consciously decided that we, we really needed to get on with this project. And so Nick and I came to the States um, to work quite briefly with Kerry Kirkpatrick, who'd written most of the first one. And during that, that conversation, I think we came up with the uh, Sam mentioned the uh, the, uh, the sun they're breaking in idea, and yes, oh, that, that seemed to unlock it. That seemed to unlock it. And the other thing I would always say is um, terribly obvious, but when you're going to work as long on the film as we of we do of necessity, um, Sam in particular, you know, if you work on a thing for six years, you've got to love it. I mean, you know, I mean. Love it. Nothing else will do. Just liking it a lot is no, is no damn good. You've got to just think this is the story that needs to be told. So we thought we'd got that story, finally, uh, and, then, and then the whole thing could start. That was the start. Yes. 
that, that's an amazing thought process that you had to go through to get here. But I mean, I understand this Chicken Run the first was such a such a popular beloved movie. Yeah. You, you want to get it right. You want to you want to take it to the next level. So so Sam, you're coming onto this and you're like, oh, now I'm directing. You you worked on the first one. So tell us a little bit about your your history with Chicken Run. A little bit, and then and then tell us how when you got into this. Oh, now I'm directing the sequel. What was important to you to really bring forth in this story? I'm going to do that. as well, because I feel it's on your back. Hey, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, so my, it's, actually, you put me on the spot, because my involvement in the first movie was very, very slight, probably hugely pivotal, but I did one shot as an animator on... Still fun on to mention. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, it's yeah. minimal. It's still fun to mention. And I wasn't, I kind of dropped, I could have, I was a stop-motion animator, I worked with Pete for, through the 90s, but I, I could never quite get clay right. There's something, about, it's, it's really hard to keep clean, uh, and just the dirt from inside me just seemed to kind of leak out onto the clay. <laughs> try as I might. So the uh, shot I did was Rocky cycling away from camera, um, so no sign of his face, it was just the back of his head as he tries to look tricycles away from camera here. Yeah. So I was just helping out. Um, Alright, you can downplay that all you want. Yeah, yeah but, they, but I mean, I've been around, I'm good, good for me because I've been around Arvin. I Pete, you know, picked me up as a, a student uh, in like 91 uh, and, you know, he sort of mentored me through the 90s from assistant to animator to director and, you know, and helped me so much. But I kind of know Arvin, I think that's, I, it was, I have so, had some confidence of being able to do, make an Arvin movie um, and did Flushed Away, so, but, the advert, no, sorry, but, um, <laughs> but the, um, but yeah, I jumped in and excited about the characters, the world, I loved the first movie, loved this notion of this, this time they're breaking in. So, you know, tend to sort of dive into things, but then like, yeah, when I was in, once I was in there, then people, a lot of people started coming up to me, just strangers started coming up to me and saying, that's my childhood <laughs> playing with, <laughs> you know, so it just felt more and more of a weight actually of the responsibility of it. And it can be a little bit, yeah, it's just sort of pressure and it sort of paralyzed. I felt kind of paralyzed at times, you know, cause you're like, oh wow, it's, where where is the edges of this? You know, like what what are the parameters really? Uh, and obviously Pete and Nick are there, Kerry's around, but I also wanted to evolve it into being a new movie and and for a new time, and I want it to be its own thing, not just a homage, and not to be too precious of the thing I loved, and just to be able to figure out how to sort of grow it uh, into this new thing. Um, the new era helped. This, this 60s idea and it, it gave us, it helps. You start, we start on the island where the last movie uh, ended and so it kind of feels like Chicken Run and then it kind of evolves into something a little bit kind of different and new and its own thing. And the other thing for me, the key was Molly because um, she's a new character, you know, and she's got a new perspective uh, and there's all sorts of things in the film about the past and the present and uh, the way of the past and like but be, being adventurous still being adventurous despite the kind of dangers that lie out ahead of you uh, which is her story uh, so so yeah it helped helped out some new characters in the in the movie it helped to be moving into a new era it did take the longest time to get my fee but um just good with Pete and Nick around you know because they're not bossy uh, at all, really not, and it's a the filmmaker's studio, they've created a studio for filmmakers and they're like, look, it's your movie. But you can tell, we're, it's all very British actually, they don't, no one, they would never stamp or demand, but could, it's maybe just a raised eyebrow sometimes. We, would, know, we, like, we would just look sad, <laughs> you know. <laughs> just get like if, a slightly sad look as you were heading If Sam yeah. made some, some terrible decision, <laughs> yeah. we, we, we wouldn't be cross. We'd no, just, just look. Just regretful. Just look no. at the floor, yeah, you'd be like, that's probably didn't get that right, yeah. So, um, so yeah, it was a good, you know, it's, it's been, a, it's, to me, it's the longest I've ever been on a movie. It's taken six years. And when I look back, I realise that actually it's taken that long because the first few years were me trying to find that, uh, you know. It's just as a matter of interest, just totally in passing, because I can hear there were flushed away fans here, uh, and Sam started that stop motion film. Yeah, that was Plan A, you know, and was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we we did all all pre production work was for a, a, another clay animated film. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and we pitched it as well, uh, that we pitched that we could do a hybrid, 
but like back then it was hard to convince <laughs> people that you could pull it off and make it affordable. So the tools have got more affordable, yeah. But yeah, I would have liked to have made Flushed Away like we did this, actually, really. Well, however you ended up making them, it was beautiful that you got to where you are, which you'll see in a few months, yeah. um, in two months. Um, but, but let's talk about for a minute, not only Sam was there for the first chicken run, you brought a lot of crew back, like Carrie, obviously, you know, for, for doing this. What's it like to come back together after all that time? And, and was there some shorthand that kind of helped you all? Like, you know, obviously your long history from 1991 mm, yeah. gave you the comfort level of working together. What's it like when you have so much crew that you can bring back? I mean, it's lovely. And in fact, yeah, Lots of those crew have been with us almost continually ever since the first one. So, you know, some of the model makers, particularly some of the animators, and lots, lots of them actually. Uh, there was a whole generation of young animators. When we started on the first chicken run, we did not have a big um, pool of animators to use. Uh, this was, I mean, Leica weren't around then. Um, I guess they'd made, um, Henry had made, uh, Nightmare in James and the Giant Peach, but there wasn't in the world. There was it was it was a small pool, and we we had about I think we had access to about eight puppet animators, and so we did a um, a training course specifically uh, in collaboration with the local university art school, and brought on I think ten young people, and most of those are still around today in different roles. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Susie was one, wasn't she? Yeah, Susie. Yeah, was, yeah. Was yeah. One. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I feel like it's such a—it is such a fine art that is that is not widely taught. Yeah. So obviously, you you didn't need to kind of grow your own roost, right? Yeah. Like you <laughs> yeah. It takes a long time to get become a real virtuoso at it, you know. And there's like, but the, it's quite a movie, you know. It's like eighteen months shoot, you know. You can get quite junior people. If you're getting them working every day, like across 18 months, they can really rise and become like mid-level or even, you know, be doing stuff that a senior would have done. And there were several people on this that came out of the Artman Academy. Um, and they, they're, they're full on animators now on the next movie, Wallace and Gromit, which is, which is already started. Coming to us. Coming. I always say, just to terrify the animators, that, um, that when you animate in stop motion, and, and Sam has referred to it, the fact that 97% of it was take one, when you animate in stop motion, you're all alone. Your, your work is all alone on the screen with, not, with, with no means of support, so it's got to be right. And it's like being um, in an orchestra. And you, I don't know if any of you are musicians, but you may know that when people play in an orchestra as an adult, they've probably rehearsed uh, many hours a day for 15 years, so you know, so they are incredibly practiced at it. And we are, well, we don't manage that yet with animation, but that is something like that is the ideal that you should really just do do a ton of it to get to, to make it natural to to be as flexible as possible and as skilled as possible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm going to detour just one sec because I, I don't know if everybody remembers that there are in between chicken runs. There's a fire at your warehouse. Oh, yeah, well, so yeah, we had and I, I don't want to bring you back to this, like, scary, no, sad no. time, but, like, oh my gosh, all your stuff's in this warehouse. Yes. What did, what did that feel like, and then you're coming to create this world again? Well, it was a big surprise, actually. Um, it was, uh... <laughs> no, it wasn't planned? Oh. I, mean, you know. <laughs> I, tell you, I tell you what happened. Um, so we live in Bristol in the west of England, and um, as you mentioned at the start, there's originally the company was two of us, me and Dave Sproxton. Dave Sproxton got up in the morning and went to his car. I thought, what's all this dust? The car was covered in dust. And that turns out that was the fallout from this. That was your studio. This inner, well, it was, a, it was a storage facility. Uh, and um, just everything in it was just vaporized. It was, it was a ferocious fire, and including all the chickens. I mean, we had. I don't know how like many we fried chicken is what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to be said. Yeah, thank sorry. You. Thank you for that. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but there were, there were probably 250 or something. All the chickens went. And also, those of you that know the first film, I mean, tragically, the, the pie machine was destroyed. And the, 
and the airplane they flew away at the end that was destroyed. So, and you know, but funny enough, we didn't. You know, we weren't planning to make a film at the time, particularly, uh, and we didn't kind of notice for a, a while. And uh, and then uh, actually, we put on um, we had an exhibition with a French company in Paris, and it's of the history of the studio. And and there was this bloody great hole in the middle where Chicken Run should have been because all the materials were, were lost. And, and also, these, when we started again with these guys, they, were, they had to be created from nothing again, didn't they? From scratch, scratch really. Yeah. So for me, I, I, luckily there was this brilliant making off book that had everything in it, so I was always going, well, there's, there's value in these Do books. you ever want to make a Chicken Run movie? There's actually a really good reference book that you can, you can use to make it. Yeah, they had a couple of boxes that weren't in the warehouse, and yeah. I remember thinking, oh, well, great, let's do it. And we opened them up, and it was like, half a leg. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like a, a bit of a grey mould that might give you a quarter of a rocky, you know, so it was, yeah. it was start from scratch. But I, the, Kate, uh, Kate, who, uh, run the team, she was able to use some new tech and solve some old problems actually, you know, because there were, there were problems with the originals that, you know, she just got yeah. to uh, make the 2.0 version. But when they came back, when, we, when I saw them again, mm. it was very moving because it was like they'd absolutely been, you know, brought back from the grave. It was yeah. superb to see it. Yeah. And beautifully done, beautifully made. And there was, there was some discussion because um, the first film is set when, I don't know, in the mid-1950s or the early 1950s. We've moved on to the uh, early 60s now. In chicken terms, these chickens would be quite old, wouldn't they? <laughs> really, really, they would. But, um, hey, it's a cartoon. So, uh, but, they're, they're but there was some... Whatever you say they are, yeah. <laughs> but there was some discussion from people Design. about making them fatter. Yeah. We just you know, them. like... Should, should they put on a bit of weight? Which, yeah. yeah. We did one des did design Rocky as a yeah, chunky, well, kind of like, actually, like really gone to seed, actually. You know, yeah. it was a funny design, but it just meant that actually all of them would be like that. Yeah, it's it's like kind of sad, the Marigold Hotel yeah. sort of break in yeah. movie or something. Well, I, what I do want to say is so you had to create them essentially from scratch again, but also like the fact that you've evolved into a family story, yeah. that's I think an important part to talk about, which yeah. you'll you'll see the dynamic is so different. What yeah. was that like to bring these characters we've known, you know, from adventure mode into like a family dynamic? It's just like looking for that next, because this time they're breaking in is a fabulous plot idea and gives you a movie, um, but you want the heart and what's going in the middle of it. and. It clearly, it, it clearly, it, in the development, it became clear that it should be Ginger's movie, you know, and that like the the first movie had something really special there, you know, like a really strong female protagonist, a, a, a great female ensemble actually, you know. But but so we looked to Ginger to, to for the heart of the movie, and then it's like, well, what's the next challenge for this freedom fighter? You know, this big hero. She's won. You know, she's got the green grass under her feet. You know, what, what could possibly challenge her now and it, someone said motherhood you know and give her a daughter and then make that daughter just like her so that so molly's like a chick off the old block and she's you see that in that scene there she's she's a freedom seeker in her own right and it's just becomes the, the interesting conflict that is at the heart of the film is between a parent and a child and you know you know a few parents but you know like you have a kid you start to become more cautious you know how bad the world is, as Ginger does, and then you begin to kind of try and create a bubble of safety for, for your child. And then you, in some unusual you know, way, she sort of becomes her ja ja the jailer of Molly. Yes. <laughs> kids the other way, you know, kids just want to get out and have adventures. They have no sense of danger or like, what's out there. They just want to go and grab it. Uh, and so like, that's the conflict. And it runs through the whole thing. We've yeah, seen the film. It, it's just a wonderful evolution of the characters and, and, and life and, and sharing that with, with, you know, again, characters that audiences have yeah. beloved to, to you get, show. You get like two Earth. POVs, you know, because it was, you know, there's a kid POV in this, you know, and, you know, you can follow the kid, the kid angle and you can follow the adult angle, which is just, it's been said a lot that an animation is not just for kids, and yeah. you know, that there's depth, and you know. But I think I think these guys know, knew that. You know, uh, briefly, we we did consider a different storyline entirely, actually, um, 
where it was uh, while he was a boy, Nobby, and the, and the key relationship was between him and Rocky, the father and son story, and uh, you know that actually was it was f almost funny. Uh, I mean, like, it was kind of a bit lighter, I suppose. Um, but um, you know, as, as Sam mentioned, we made this extraordinary, you know, really strong female lead, and, it's, and the general feeling amongst our colleagues at work, was, especially the women, is why the hell are you changing, changing this great female lead for a stupid bloke? So, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we, we didn't. And that, which was great, and, but, and you know, that was a great decision. Yeah, that, yeah, was key, yeah. that was such an important decision because that relationship is, is beautiful in the film, but it did set us back. A, it did set us back a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But sometimes you you learn. That, that's part of the process, the though, right? To yeah. find you know the right story you're supposed to tell it takes time to walk that path. You can't so. you can't show up with just. Yeah. Something that's not quite right. It never works that way. And it's better for, for all your thoughtful iterations that you yeah. go through. Um, so I'm looking at the time. I think I want to ask the audience. I'm going to stand up now so I can see you too. Um, ben, do we have a microphone to run around in the audience or are we just going to let people speak up? Okay. I can do that. I can do it. So does anybody, okay, you sir with the hat. Well, the question's about, yes, the, the Aardman story. How do you make that magical thing that you do? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Something in the water? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, being British is a huge part of it, I think. <laughs> Well, I, think I mean, it just, I mean, it just is, you know, like, I don't want, because we just uh, self-edit in a different way to what you would do in, what you do in the States, I think, you know, uh, and, the, and the sense of humor is slightly different, um, but that's not the heart of it, is it? I mean, those are, those are almost details, it's, it, we take it very seriously. But then everyone takes stories seriously. Um, um, we take seriously. We we um, we actually here. Maybe maybe this is a key thing. Actually, um, we've rightly mentioned the that there's a strong emotional story at the heart of this that, that gives it a real real substance. And I watch it. You know, when I watched the um, first screening with a big audience, the premiere, I had the Lump in my throat, and a, a manly tear in my eye. But, uh, uh, like, like the film I knew so well. So, so that. So I'm saying it has a real heart to it. But I'd also say that, that when we list the things that are important to us, comedy is almost top of the list. You know, we want we because I'm old-fashioned old enough to think that films are meant to be like really entertaining, like to make you know to make yeah make you. And when you you know, as filmmakers. You know, make them laugh. We lo that is so satisfying with, to make to bring make an audience laugh. It's lovely when they're crying as well, but it's not so you don't notice it so much. So no, we we try to make them laugh. We and we do emphasise comedy, and that's why both both the Chicken Run films then have this profound absurdity in them because because chickens are famously cowardly and stupid. Right? Everyone <laughs> everyone thinks that. And so, you know, so it goes, you know who, who are you going to make the hero? What, a chicken is going to be your hero? Yes, yes, damn it. We'll make chickens into real heroes. People don't notice the depth and darkness of things, I think. You know, because no. chicken running itself is, so, is incredibly dark, you know. Like it's it's really know. just a little dark. Like, yeah, we, what we, happens in Funland, yeah. after all? Yeah, and right? there too, you know. So it's just, we we'll made the same decision. Today. But, you know, like Edwina. She gets the chop, and then like later in that scene in the kitchen, Mr. Tweedy's chatting. There's a carcass on the top in front of him. That's so dark. It, it, it is. Knows, everyone goes, oh, that was a wiener. It's a sensitive subject, right? Like you know, yeah. but but everybody's having a good time. You, so you treat, it, you treat it again, like with with heart and comedy, and in it, I mean that's life. But it's 
but I, I do think you're right. There's something to how they craft a story and share that is just so heartwarming and endearing. So thank you for doing that. Again, you'll see here, it's, it's alive and well. So um, let me ask other questions. Okay, sir in the green shirt. Hi, um, so I'm just, I, I, I actually work remotely uh, for Leica. Oh, you do? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm a CG rigger. So cool. my, um, my question is, so we, so we do you know, replacement uh, animation for the faces, which I'm yeah. sure you know. Yeah. Um, and the one thing I've always found really interesting is the fact that you guys uh, still use clay, which is yeah. awesome. So how do you how, how do y'all keep the uh, the clay's uh, like mouth or the phenomes like um, still like not dry? Like how, how do you how do you uh, keep them from drying out? Yeah. It sounds like a moisturizing question yeah, here. Yeah. So yes, no, how, so how do you keep the clay from, <laughs> from drying out? You're right. It is well worked. So. Yeah, it's a special formula of clay. They you know buy I think it's Harvard's British plasticine, but they mix more oil into it and keep it more flexible. So there's a very particular recipe that's been arrived at over the years, and it's just the right amount. It's soft enough to get a thumbprint on it, which, is, which we want. Sure. Um, and then, but yeah, it doesn't crack or crumble or dry. I think they do, to be honest, they, they will. They, they're wrapped in cling film overnight, and you know, they, you know you keep the air, keep them away from the air. But, um, I, but think, I think I need to talk to you about, you know, Aging, yeah. you know, <laughs> I think this Get is yeah. but, but yet, has it, it changed over the years? Like, have what you use in not, your process? Not, not really. Not much. Mm -hmm. Not much. The fact, I mean, those. Re well, Sam showed you some of those replacement mouth shapes from Mrs. Tweedy. Um, Thirty years ago, I, I, we would have. We didn't do replacements. We just and we say you animate through. You 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 re sculpt the face, take a frame, re sculpt the face, take an absolutely crazy project. <coughs> um, now, as you, we have these substitute faces, as you see, so that that's, makes a change. Um, and what, part of it for us is that part of it actually is that the animators like it. You know, I mean, the, the directors like the result as well, but the animators like that extra power they have, you know, engagement they have, because uh, you, you put a mouth on, it literally smooth the lines, you thought you could see the lines on the screen, you smooth it because it's clay, uh, and that's your frame, but then you can go back into the next frame, you don't have to replace it, you can tweak it, just touch it, the tiny little touches, it's so amazing given the heads that you're that big, the, the delicacy of the touch, the way they just gently tweak up, they tweak up the eyebrow, or or tweak at the edge of the mouth a little with their thumbs, you know, it's extremely <laughs> lots of brilliant. What they we did. tried to do it with Flushed Away. When we went out there, they were making the mouth shapes for the Flushed Away characters in CG. Mm -hmm. And play is so brilliant because it moves in any direction, in any way. It's the most malleable, mir miraculous substance. And when they were trying to do that with a CG thing, they're adding extra isopalms and the rigging and the headaches and the blend shapes. Yeah, yeah. It was so hard to do it. Did you do it? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's like, oh, you can just do it in clay. <laughs> yeah, just get your hand on it. It's still like a hand on a piece of clay. It's still pretty cool. So, such connectivity with your art, literally. Yeah, yeah. literally. It's so subtle, like he says, it's so subtle. Yes, you can it's amazing. Do it. yeah. All right, a couple more questions. Let's see. I'm going to go, um, Jeremy, in the, in the peak, I can't tell what color shirt that is. You with your glasses. Yes, sir. <laughs> go ahead. You. Uh, so I want to know what you guys are, like, influenced by them. You said Artman stories are, like, very British. But, like, where, like, does that come from? Like British comedy, British film, like yeah. what is like your influence? Yeah, you can agree. I grew up in the 70s, I'm a little younger, but I grew up through the 70s. So Monty Python was there, Terry, <laughs> Terry Gilliam's animation. Um, even kids' TV had a kind of quirkiness to it. Like if you ever get confined to the clangers, it's like quite kooky actually when you, when you consider it. Um, Bob, Bob Godfrey, custard, rhubarb and custard 2D was really scribbly 2D thing. So yeah, there's always been an irreverence, isn't there? And it goes through, you know, League of Gentlemen and, yeah. you know, uh, this yeah, British comedy, right? Yes, I mean, I think British comedy very much so. There's a thing about British comedy, which I'm not, which is, which is true, um, is that uh, British comedy is very often about terrible people, um, <laughs> lo losers, 
big, you know, like, um, have you seen the, the British office, the English office? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, a monster, a dreadful man, you know. <laughs> you know. Uh, and, um, yeah, oh, Father Ted, you know Father Ted? Oh, yeah. You know, you know, these, I mean, so things like that, they're, they're great, and, and they're, you know, awful people. And I don't know why that is, but it's true, it's true. Now, in fact, we do it, we do it less than that. We, we don't go for that tone very much, actually. We don't. Um, yeah, Miss Tweedy's not so, quite there. No, no. Miss no, Tweedy's no. pretty horrible. Yeah, she's pretty horrible. She's <laughs> um, yeah, so, that, so there's, there's something in that. And then, and then uh, yes, influenced by, of course, by British film and TV generally, I suppose. So, so we just come, you know, that's our background. The, that thing that, that Sam mentioned, the clangers, I mean, that, that's quite esoteric. I don't, anyone seen the clangers? No, I can't. No. <laughs> uh, that, that does not surprise me. And, and, but, uh, but it's worth a minute of your time, it's I think. Really, it's really good, actually. It's really good. So we were brought up, uh, me, me older than Sam, obviously, with, uh, with um, a range of puppet animation shows that were for kids. But I get you know again we don't try to copy them, but I think but I think the the warmth that I recall from those shows the not here's here's a thing now we're going to get philosophic now the fact that um, when you watch it you know you're watching a puppet uh, and you know it's a puppet because it looks like a puppet uh, and you know it's a puppet and you and you know it's alive and and that. That magic between understanding those two different things at the same time is what you get from puppet animation, I think. And, and with endless respect and admiration, you don't get from CG in the same way because you've got you believe the characters are alive, which is terribly important. But then, what is what else is it? It's it's some it's someone on a keyboard. And it's zeros and ones, you know. That, but but yeah, so. I think about like morph. You've had morph for yeah. fifty years. I don't know. Uh, nearly, nearly forty-seven. Forty-something. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and and that's been a beloved character, and it's clearly a puppet, and it's yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, like yeah. you, you've right. carried that through generations now. Yes. There's some. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's great honesty about that because he, if you don't know, he's that big, uh, and he appears to be made of clay, and he is, and he is, and he he's, appears. He he's a very authentic to what yes. he is. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, let's do a couple more questions, sir, right here in the front. I appreciate the more shout out, first of all. Um, I actually, if it makes you feel better, I have a friend that worked on the clangers. Uh, but um, my question was, oh yeah, thanks again for coming out and talking. I love how uniquely British your stories are. Uh, it was like more of a technical question. Uh, so you mentioned like we're kind of approaching a digital age with like stop motion and animation. So like, do you do your animators prefer to use like tie downs more often when you can? Or like, do you often use like a rig mounts or like, What's like the happy medium? Do you like try to use one method over the other? Or, like, is it more of a headache to like erase them? I think mostly tie downs. They like, you know, because they're just. Um, it, it, the, I don't know whether it's IK or I don't know which which kind of forward K or IK is, not it? You know, but it's just like, yeah. If you, once you've got that foot locked, you can move to the hip. I, 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 more than anything, I saw that, you know, and even with uh, Tweedy walking down that spiral staircase, which is. I, well, I thought that would be on the rig, and it wasn't. They they, they figured out a way to tie her down onto the staircase. So yeah, in general, but, but you know, you digital, you've got green screen. They can they can do the rigs like getting Babs to be an action hero, <laughs> and jump around. That did need a really rather substantial rig, actually, like a giant winder, you know, to kind of get her off the ground. Does anyone here know Morph? Do you know Morph at all? Well, Morph Morph is it's made of clay. And he's that big. In fact, he's in the back room. I'll get him. I'll get him. And um, and he has no armature and no tie down at all. So for like five years, I animated him every day without uh, without tie downs or anything. He just the only the only thing that kept him standing upright was his feet were kind of sticky, so they kind of stuck to the floor. And that was that was kind of it. Helps. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to take one last question because we want to move into our next phase of today's event. Um, I'm going to go to you in the middle here. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Mine's a little silly, um, but my question is: all the chickens use like regular household items to get through their situations. Uh, which is your personal favorite and why? 
<laughs> wow. Um, from from the first one, the um, the, the the whisk that she uses to dig a tunnel. That's that's very that's cool. clever. That was cool. Yeah. yeah. They use a, they pump up a, to get through an electric fence in this one, they use a rubber tyre and a pump and they pump up a rubber tyre and it makes a rubber hole for them to jump through and then they yeah. just pop it and it disappears. Yeah. And I thought that was really clever actually. There are so, there are so many fun new yeah, creative ways film, of yeah. getting into and out of situations in this film. You, you are going to love this, so <laughs> wonderful. Well, I do want to move into um, the next part of our event, but I want to say first of all, thank you Sam, thank you Peter for being... Thank you, thank you.